Okay, thanks. Oh, thank you very much. I, I want to tell you that my wife, Marion, who's back there, and incidentally, if you really want the lowdown about Special Olympics, talk to Marion, not to me. She'll give you the real stories about things that happen. Anyway, Mary and I are delighted to be in this very special part of Canada and to be among the very special Canadians who live here. Um, I have a real challenge this afternoon because what I, I'm going to try to do is tell you a 50-year story in about 15 minutes. So you'll understand if I move a bit quickly at times and if I skip over a few details along the way of, the, of those 50 years. Um, what I'm going to try to do, I think I'm going to try to do, is uh, explain to you how this became this. Okay. The, and, and became that way through a great entrepreneurial quest that it fits in with your theme of an entrepreneurial exercise. This back here is a photo from early, say, about 1961, and uh, of a fitness exercise program in a basement room that we uh, set up in a school for mentally handicapped right in downtown Toronto. And uh, what I thought I'd do is explain to you maybe some of the factors. I've sort of looked over that before coming here and say, what are maybe four or five things that I could tell them that seemed significant. Why did it work? You know, and there are a lot of reasons why it worked, but I'll give you a few, and which may work with any entrepreneurial exercise, things that you could apply to whatever your quest will be, the dream that you want to make into reality. Whether it does or how it does, I leave it up to you to apply that. I think that uh, the first thing is that it starts with an idea. Now, uh, all these years ago, I tell you, I had a hell of a good idea. <laughs> now, I tell you that with all due modesty, okay? <laughs> but it really uh, proved to be a terrific idea. But maybe a lot of you already have your idea. If you don't have your idea, I'll tell you it won't happen in a vacuum. It won't come to you that way. You've got to get out and explore. You've got to get more experiences. It will come out from those life experiences, from your study, your education, the incidents that happen to you. And somewhere along the line, that idea will pop. And when it does, don't miss it, because it can go by in an instant. So you're sort of aware along the way uh, that you can do that. How I did that was back in, and that's me, by the way, uh, testing leg strength. This, this uh, picture is about 51 years old, and you can see I haven't changed a bit, right, in that time. Uh, it's uh, amazing. Anyway, I got my experience that way, too, that the idea came out of. By working in this school, I had come up, I did my graduate work at the University of Illinois in exercise physiology and psychology, and uh, my interest really was in the fitness and health of this population. So we measured strength and found that they had about half the strength. In fat, they carried on average about 35% more fat. In endurance tasks like muscular endurance or running, cardiovascular endurance, um, they fatigued about 35% faster than uh, the kids without a uh, mental handicap that uh, was our control group. So when I did this, I uh, put it all together and I said, uh, geez, maybe we should do something about that. But many people said to me, well, what do you expect? You know, in those days, they said they're retarded. That was the word, uh, which is not an appropriate word these days. But they, they just assumed that was something connected to the mental handicap. They're mentally handicapped, so of course they're physically handicapped or slow or stumble when they walk or fatigue quickly. But then the other thing in terms of exploring and getting my idea once I got exposed to this population, I found out a lot of other things about them, got close to them. I saw them arrive in taxis every morning at the school and go home the same way at night. I knew that when they went home, there would be no neighborhood play, you know, no road hockey for them. People wouldn't even go in the backyard and play catch with them. They wouldn't even learn to ride a bike because people figured they couldn't learn that. They're mentally handicapped. 
But when and I, so I said, well, if I had that lifestyle or you had that lifestyle, we probably wouldn't perform any better than they do. And maybe if we replace that and we change some of it, things will change. So um, I did that by four uh, experimental programs to try to change their strength, try to change, as in this case, running endurance. A lot of people said they won't do it. You'll never get them active. These girls don't look too unhappy. I suppose there's no ladies in this audience that will recognize those old gym uniforms back there that went, uh, thank God they're gone, eh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and what we found overall, if you could sum it all together, which you can't, um, we, re we closed half the gap in one year. If you could say overall that they were half as fit, at the end of a school year, they were 75% as fit, and they were still getting better. Maybe we could close the whole thing. So um, with this astounding research that I had done, I wrote it all up in a scientific way, and I traveled over to Rome to the first International Congress of the Psychology of Sport, and I presented my findings there, which I thought would be received with great applause, but it was received more with great indifference over there. People weren't really interested in psychology of sport for a group like this. So um, I thought, well, it's out there anyway, and people will see it. I'll go home, and I'm sure the Nobel Committee will be phoning me within the next <laughs> I'll get the call from Oslo. Well, it didn't happen. So I said, Frank, if the scientists aren't interested, maybe the practitioners will be. And that's really who you're doing this for the teachers, the physical educators, maybe and sometimes recreationists, coaches, the parents themselves, the neighbors, and of course the children themselves. So I wrote it up in a little book. This little book is pretty small. The title was Physical Fitness for the Mentally Retarded. Again, inappropriate title today, but it wasn't 40, 50 years ago. And uh, that contained how to test them, how to assess the test, how to prescribe exercise on the basis of that, give example of programs, how to set up a training session, and uh, how to evaluate whether it was working or not. I went to my grant agency and I said, if you'll give me $1,000, I can get 1,000 copies of this printed. And I said, uh, We'll give away the first 500 because people won't even know about it. That would be the lost leader, if you like. And the uh, second 500 will sell for two bucks a piece, and you'll get your money back. They said, OK. They gave me the money. That's indeed what happened. But subsequently, after that, we sold 50,000 copies of this. Now, that. Um, that's another thing about your entrepreneurial exercise. You go out and test the market, and you see whether there really is a need for what you're pushing and what your idea is. And um, I thought, gee, we could do that, not just in that place in downtown Toronto, but all over the place if we get people excited about it. I think the second thing you do with your idea after this exploration is that you package it in some way. And I decided the best way to package it was through sport. Now, this is fine. This is good. And I've reread this, by the way, recently. And I'll tell you, it's really well written. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to put this down. But I'll tell you, it, for me, it wasn't the real answer. To do the changes that we really wanted in a mass way, I figured it needed sport. Sport that has all the training element to it, the goal orientation, the support programs, the rewards, uh, the evaluation and comparison with others, the excitement of competition. That is what we needed to introduce. Really, rather than straight motor learning, what I was trying to do was really bring this world to her. Now, this is a little UK gymnast, actually. And to bring that world to him. That's an Irish gymnast. And the boy looking at him and smiling at him is his brother. And uh, you can see how obviously proud he is of him. 
So I packaged that that way as sport, and I went to the Centennial Commission. You know, 1967, very few of you were around in 1967, but I was. And, uh, that was our 100th birthday here in Canada, right? I worked with the Centennial Commission. They'd come to me to put together a fitness award that you could only win during 1967, and which subsequently became the Canada Fitness Awards, which all of you probably got exposed to somewhere along the line in school. And, uh, and on a trip up to Ottawa, I presented this idea, a three-year proposal planned out, budgeted, the whole thing developed programs across the country in sport. And in 1967, we would celebrate Canada's 100th birthday with the big um, games at the CNE in Toronto. And I thought, I wonder if they'll buy this. They instantly said, terrific, we'll do that. That's just the kind of thing we want for Centennial. All the participation and the party atmosphere. They would supply money for it, not just for the two years lead up and the games, but I figured we'd have a great legacy afterward. And it would have happened. <laughs> so it would have happened here. But um, then another strange thing happened. That's just what will happen to you with your idea. Serendipity. Out of the blue, something happened. I got a telephone call one day. And a guy says to me, I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., and I do uh, advisory work for the Kennedy Foundation. I didn't even know there was a Kennedy Foundation. I knew there was a Kennedy family. Um, actually, yeah, when, at that time, this is about January 65, and uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated about a year, just over a year, year and a half before that. And uh, said so this is operated by the Kennedy family, and they wanted to know if you would come down and talk to them about your work. And I said, well, yeah, that would be nice. And you'll play for the plane, of course. Oh, yeah. So uh, they could afford that. And uh, so I went down there. And one of the things that I presented to them was the same thing that I had shown the Centennial Commission. And I had actually met with Eunice Kennedy Shriver and her husband, Sergeant Shriver, when I went down there that night at their home. And... Uh, the one thing he had in his hand when he came through the door was that proposal that I had sent down to them. And within about three minutes, he said, can you do this in the United States? And I said, well, somebody can, but not me. I'll give you a hand. So as I'm going out the door, Mrs. Shriver says, Sarge, you're not just going to let him walk out. I mean, what are we going to do now? She says, I don't see a problem. Dr. Hayden will come down here, work at the foundation. I said, hold on. You know, I'm in Canada. I have a job. I have students. I went to at the University of Western Ontario by this time. And um, he said, oh, well, we'll see. For three months, they kept phoning me and everything. When are you coming? When are you coming? I said, I'm not coming. I'm not coming. <laughs> and in four months, I was there. <laughs> and I stayed there most of the next seven years. Now, the other thing, where are we here? You know, I figure with your idea, you get the idea, you package it. Uh, and then uh, you have to put a name on it. Okay? The name Special Olympics turned out to be a terrific name for us. You know, people know. I chose that, first of all, I wanted to make sure people know this is sport. Sport as sport was meant to be. Maybe not the way some Olympic elements are right now, but the way it was for de Goubertin back in 1898. And uh, special because that conveyed who it was for. You got special education, special needs, special services, special Olympics, this way. And nobody's ever quarreled about that except the United States Olympic Committee. Now, when I put it uh, on the first games we ran, at first they didn't know what I was up to. And it took them about a year and a half to catch up with me. And then they said, you know, there's an act of Congress that permits only us to use the word Olympic, Olympiad, the five rings, etc. And I said, well, I'd wait a while and then respond, send a letter and said, would you explain that to me again? <laughs> and this went on for about six months and finally we got letters and they sent, uh, wrote to Senator Ted Kennedy at this time and they threatened to sue all of us, me, the Kennedy Foundation, the Kennedy family, Special Olympics for taking something that didn't belong to us. And, uh, and actually, at one point, Ted 
phoned me and said, Frank, maybe you should change the name. And I said, no, Senator, I'd sooner not. It's a terrific name, and we've built up so much with it already. Uh, the way that was resolved, eventually, I arranged for a couple of people from the United States Olympic Committee, a couple of members of the Kennedy family, to sit down in the same room and to talk about it. Um, you know, a lot of the things in the, that you'll encounter and difficulties with people, they change when you're face to face and eye to eye and sit down together. Even Skype won't do it for you. <laughs> I say that as a man of my age, okay? But uh, it didn't hurt that I had the meeting in the offices of uh, a man named Feldman who had been President Kennedy's legal advisor in the White House. And uh, the uh, and as you looked out from his office, you could see the White House right out there. So <laughs> the the surroundings and the orientation didn't hurt for the meeting. <laughs> and after about an hour, hour and a half, we left that meeting as I don't know something like Group G members of the United States Olympic Committee, with permission to use the name, as long as we informed them about some things. Um, the thing that I wanted to do down there, I came down to do, I didn't have Special Olympics, the name, I came down to do the Centennial Games and the build up to it, and it took three years. They, got, they lost their interest in it, and other people didn't. For three years, I kept making presentations, and that's the other thing, that if you think your idea is really good, don't give up on it, and don't let people's indifference or people who naysay it Go with the people who do agree with you. You don't need too many along the way. Over the period of all those years, I often would get calls from guys in different states saying they won't do this. And I'm saying, forget them. You know, just find a couple, two, three people, and you'll do it. And as soon as they see what you're doing, then uh, things will change. So that was the idea, at the, that once you got the idea, you packaged it, you put a name on it, you've got to show it. You can talk till you're blue in the face. Show all the slides and movies and so on, but until you really show it, they don't know what you're talking about. That's what I had intended to do for the centennial. But finally, in 1968, I got the chance to do it here, to uh, design, organize, and direct a national games in Chicago at Soldier Field. We had um, over 900, close to 1,000 athletes from 26 states, and a floor hockey team from Toronto wearing the uniforms of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Back in those, back in those days, you wore that sweater with great pride, I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, this, this 68, 67 was the last year they won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Anyway, I said, you know, they played such great floor hockey at the Beverly School in Toronto where I did my work. I got a team out of there to come and show them. And then I got a friend in Chicago, approached the Blackhawks, and he got Stan Makita, the captain of the Blackhawks at that time, to go out and train a team at Palos Park to come in and play this team, which uh, actually came with George Armstrong, who was the captain of the Maple Leafs at that time. So, and we set up this floor on the infield, and which we use for some other purposes. But anyway, I know you'll want to know, the game ended in a 6-6 tie. But the Leafs would settle for that today, right? <laughs> they, they wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing I think, and when you develop your entrepreneurial idea is, at least my experience was that it's better to do it from the top down instead of the bottom up. My original idea in Canada was to go across the country and build it up, up, and then, but that would take forever, take a long time. And it works better if you start up here. Special Olympics, wherever it exists, is um, a house built from the roof down. They see what it is, and then you send them back and you give them the help to do it. And lo and behold, the next year, 69, we had seven regional games, and they're doing a bigger thing at those regionals than I did in Chicago. And along with that, in the next year, the states were, each state was doing things even bigger. Within two years, I had organizations and programs in 
every one of the states. And actually, they were running annual state games in every one of those states. The idea went along. Same thing, uh, I'm jumping a, a little bit, and thing, but the same thing happened internationally. How the chance came to, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. I said, yeah, uh, Frank, you'll recognize the time when it comes to take it internationally, because that was always in the back of my mind. Finally, uh, it came, but we built it much the same way, top down. This is, a, uh, this is in Paris, the National Sport Institute in Vincennes. Those games were organized by volunteers, and then, uh, the last I heard, they've been doing them manually for about 30 or 40 years, and maybe they still go on. This is in Ireland, in Limerick. You know, the Kennedys obviously had some connections in Ireland, so that was an early start of Special Olympics in Ireland. I toured the world with it. I, uh, about 12 countries had represented us at a meeting we had in the United States, and they wanted to talk to Mr. Schreiber and said, can you get somebody, we have somebody, to do for us what Hayden did for you in the United States? And uh, because uh, you're so far ahead of us by this time now, and uh, it ended up being Hayden. And, and, and uh, I took three and a half years leave from McMaster and toured the world with it, helping places like this in Buenos Aires and Argentina to run games here in uh, Santiago in Chile. That uh, fellow in the middle um, is Admiral Moreno. He's passed away now, but he's the guy who led the coup against Allende, established a military dictatorship. Now, you can argue about military dictatorships, but you can get things done if they're on your side, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's his wife in the white. She was like the Evita of Chile, and that's me. You see, again, I haven't changed very much. You know, my hair's grown a little bit, and on the other side of me, looking rather bored, is the wife of the American ambassador. Japan took it and did with it like they've done a lot of things with uh, Western imports from there. Terrific, both winter and summer activities. Hong Kong was a super place. They had uh, great volunteers, a great leadership there. They had involvement of sport coaches and people and this, the sports stadium and sport complex there in Hong Kong from the beginning. And uh, they amazed me. And, uh, in the end, there was a great friend of mine, still is, Dick and Young, who headed that up. And uh, I kept saying to him, Dick, and when are we going to get into the People's Republic of China, into mainland China? And I said, you know, there are a billion people living there. Think of the market, you know, with a billion people. And he kept saying, be patient, Frank, be patient. You can't just run in there. And I must say, and he said, like an American, but anyway. Uh, he, and then I was back at McMaster about two years after two years of overtures that he made. He knew how to do it. He knew the people. He knew the culture. He called me and said, Frank, they're ready. And uh, he said, they want you to come over and train people. And uh, uh, we asked them, come to China or come to Hong Kong. And they, of course, want to go to Hong Kong. Most of them have never been outside of town. So they sent uh, 24 people, two from each of 12 regions of China, a couple of translators. I spent a week or 10 days with them, one of the great weeks of my life. They're wonderful people. The first night I met with them, and I said, well, I just have one question to ask you. I said to the interpreter, why are you here? Why do you think you're here? Because I knew the government would be involved. I didn't know how they selected. I had doctors of ancient Chinese medicine. I had physicians. I had thank God, a few coaches and uh, physical education people, social workers. I said, uh, why are you here? And they buzzed and they couldn't understand the question. Then they came back and said, that's an easy question to answer. Well, I said, you're going to tell us what to do and we're going to go back and do it. <laughs> I said, fantastic, that's all I wanted. If I asked the same thing over in Europe and told you what they'd do, they'd tell me five ways that were better. That's uh, great. And they did. They went back to those 12 regions. They ran major games in every one of those 12 regions within a year. And they ran national games just after that year expired and invited me to come back and see their, nat uh, their national games. It's terrific. The, under 
the other thing with this is that uh, five years, you know, the progression from there, that would be in the early 80s, the progression from there, five years ago, China hosted the World Summer Games for 7,000 athletes, 165 countries in Shanghai. But it grew really out of uh, Hong Kong. The, um, this part of it is maybe the most important part. Um, to realize that it's what happens at the local level. This is where Special Olympics really happens. On a track, in a pool, on an ice rink. Every day, every week, along the way. Not at games. Games are important to the whole movement, but that, this is why we do it. And, uh, or here in a pool. <laughs> there, yeah, I've changed just a little bit there now. That's a, a, this is what I stressed everywhere I went in the world, that this is the thing that's important. And the only way I could convince them, I never came like this, I came like that and I work with children, and when they saw I was willing to do it, you know, they're pretty skeptical when I arrived. When they saw that I would get out with children I'd never met before and who didn't speak English, uh, they uh, then started to listen to me. This, is a, uh, this was a storeroom in downtown Athens at a school there. We cleaned it out in the morning. I ran a demonstration there for a couple hours in the afternoon. They brought teachers in from all the schools around, and... Uh, Interesting thing uh, is that, uh, what would it be, three years ago, Athens hosted the world summer games there, again with 7,000 athletes, even in the difficult economic situation in Greece now, they hosted that there. And I'm thinking, this is where it started and that's where it's gotten to. The name itself, I say, was uh, putting the label on it was uh, Difficult thing to decide, or, or the logo. The logo has its own story. That one uh, it didn't start with them. I started with a small one. But uh, Expo 67, really, that's what that circle of characters is. And if you see the logo from that, I stole it from Montreal. <laughs> but actually, as they say, I was trying to bring that world to guys like this. Okay? The... Uh, the volunteer part of it is really important. You know, it was, at the beginning, it was like 99% volunteer. Now it's still probably 95%. Um, people like that that we could recruit to the cause in the relationship between them and the athletes, and especially coaches. You know, like any sport program, it stays with the coaches. And we had to get people who knew the sport and also got to know our athletes as well officials. Um, everywhere I went, the, the, we tried to get the top officials. I remember first games in the UK after it was over, they, the officials were the ones that officiated at uh, European games or European track and field meets and so on. They came in their uniforms, their blazers, girls with their uh, gray skirts and everything. And I'm talking to the director in the middle of the field one uh, morning, it was a really, really hot day. And uh, the chief official comes up and is saying, oh, and, and he says to the, uh, the director of games, excuse me, sir, he says, uh, permission to take off our jackets. And I <laughs> looked at him, I said, permission to take off your jacket? I can't believe it. If this was happening in the United States, they'd never have a jacket or even a shirt on to start with. And, and I thought, geez, we've really made it. You know, when we attract that formality of officiating, and officiating is so much a part and importance of it as uh, I guess the Ukraine just found out in their game against England the other day. <laughs> okay, I'll just be two minutes, okay? The, um, but again, to come back, what you've got to do is, the other thing I mentioned to you is keep your mission in mind, your reason for being, and don't lose it. It's easy to lose it along the way. If we run games like this, Notre Dame here, Metrodome in Minneapolis, we start to lose track. We think that's what it's all about rather than this. And that we have a sport for all program, for him and also for him. That's really the local program, that it starts here and then eventually comes to that. That's where the important part of ours is. 
I'll tell you, emotion is a big part of it. Special Olympics has provided me with some of my greatest emotions. I've been so frustrated and upset and sad at times and, and frustrated, but it's also given me some of my greatest joys and happiness as well. It's all part of the sport, of course, has a great emotional com component to it, as here. Um, so that's part and parcel, but I think that's important for what you do. Don't avoid the emotion, build the emotion in, because in the end, both the positive and negative emotion is what this is what it produces in the end. And it's the passion that will carry you and carry your dream. And I hope when you do it that it brings lots of joy and happiness and satisfaction and accomplishment and even love to your life as it has to mine. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>